Hello everyone. Last year I made exotic tier lists for all of the classes and you all have been asking for an update. So I'm going to do that over the next however long it takes me to do it. As usual, we'll be starting with Titan. Uncharacteristic of these tier list videos, I will be using a similar system to the previous year's tier list where we'll talk about which exotics are best for which subclasses along with where any neutral exotics may come into play. As a reminder, the exotic tier list is about what I believe to be the best overall options for PvE and PvP in the game across as many skill levels as possible. It is not my favorites, it is not your favorites, it's not what can be good, it is purely based on min-maxing. With builds being a little more relevant nowadays, I will be mentioning exotics that have a place in certain builds, or builds that are good with certain exotics. But overall, the tier list is meant to talk about the best exotics in the most situations to the most amount of people. Also, I will try to refrain from mentioning seasonal artifact mods as they will vary from season to season. The activities in PvE that matter the most for the tier list are master level content, the raid, and any high power level activities or seasonal activities. Let's start with the new Season of Dawn exotic, Severance Enclosure. This exotic triggers an explosion whenever you get a melee kill in PvP or a finisher kill in PvE. The explosion effect is not bad. The radius is approximately the size of the little bubble shape you're put into when the animation on your finisher starts. It'll clear out nearby low tier enemies really easily, but anything above that will probably stay alive. However, I'm not really feeling this exotic too much as I feel like finishers are more of a utility effect and not something that you would want to spam a lot in order to kill a lot of enemies. At least I don't think it is. I definitely would not use this in master level content either. There are some places to use it in certain raids, but it's not really a difference maker. It's not really gonna make or break your experience. Next up, we have Shadowkeep's Phoenix Cradle, solely utilized in bottom tree Sunbreaker. Sun Warrior lasts twice as long, and allies are also given Sun Warrior. This is a really good exotic for this tree, almost unbelievably so. I don't think you could really ask for more. Bottom tree's biggest problem is that in Destiny right now, everything dies so fast that you don't really get to utilize the sunspots a lot. In any sort of arena-based area, forges, blindwell, stuff like that, they work a lot better, along with in areas where you actually have extended combat sequences. However, even just being able to tap a sunspot for a 10 second buff that anyone can get is still really good, and if you can fight in it for any amount of time, it's even better. This is one of two exotics slash builds that I actually utilize in master content. Now things really haven't changed that much since the last tier list update. There are a couple of new additions to the list from over the past year, but for Titans, the game hasn't really changed. For example, for Striker Titans, Insurmountable Skull Fort still reigns supreme as the best subclass specific exotic. It is efficiency incarnate, allowing you to take out tons of enemies with your melee attack, and best of all, it works with any of the branches. Shoulder Charge, AoE Killing Machine. Death Room Above, same thing. Frontal Assault, bonus damage forever. It is tough to find another exotic with this kind of killing potential and health regeneration to keep you fighting. While you could use a Skullfort style build in master level content, it's generally much riskier compared to just using Ward of Dawn, but it does work. Sentinel Titans will still be looking at Doomfang Pauldrons as an offensive option. They have everything you want in an exotic that focuses on your super, ways to get bonus super energy, and ways to keep your super going for longer. Ursa Furiosa was quite good due to the fact that the new branch of Sentinel allowed for a mobile version of Weapons of Light, on top of the fact that you were given quite a generous amount of super energy for blocking damage. Unfortunately, two things happened. Number one, they nerfed the amount of super energy that you gained from blocking, and number two, Ward of Dawn got Weapons of Light in Shadowkeep, so there was no reason to run Middle Tree for Weapons of Light outside of very specific circumstances. If you happen to be in those very specific circumstances where you need to block often, then sure, I guess you can use Ursa, 
I don't know where those circumstances even exist anymore, though, at least as of this video. Helm of Saint-14 is back to some degree thanks to Ward of Dawn's new relevance, and I think the main appeal of the helm at this point is actually the overshield portion, giving you armor, blessing, and weapons of light all at the same time. However, in Destiny 1, Helm of Saint-14's main appeal, the blinding effect, was more necessary if you were running blessing or weapons of light. Since Armor of Light comes default on Ward of Dawn, you're going to be pretty well protected while inside the ward anyway. So you'll be really hard to kill while in the ward regardless, which was one of the main selling points of the blinding effect back in Destiny 1. Safety. I would definitely not think twice if I saw someone wearing this exotic, but I think the blinding effect is maybe not as important as it once was. It's still not a bad pick though. For Sunbreaker, ever since the nerfs to Hammer Strike and all other debuffs, I've been more of a Ward of Dawn bot than a Hammer Strike bot. We also have Divinity now to provide debuffs from range. Therefore, while Hallowfire Heart was last year's pick to be able to provide many Hammer Strikes, the only other option you have is Phoenix Cradle for Sunbreakers in terms of best subclass specific exotic. Hallifire Heart is still really good, it didn't get nerfed or anything, it still provides tons of energy, and it is great for builds that use grenades and melee a lot. However, what I think gives Phoenix Cradle the edge is that it's fantastic with teammates, whereas Hallifire isn't as much. The way I would split it is Hallifire for solo ability-based builds, and Phoenix Cradle for basically everything else, although you could also use Phoenix Cradle for solo ability builds. In terms of subclass neutral exotics, we have Armamentarium, Crest of Alpha Loopy, Heart of Inmost Light, Peregrine Greaves, and Worm God Caress. If you don't want to have to think at all, or maybe you're running a grenade build, Armamentarium is probably going to be your friend. I think there are far more fun and better exotics to use if you're going for a grenade based build though, like Heart of Inmost Light. I really like Heart of Inmost Light because it places a priority on ability usage. There are a lot of Titan subclass abilities that regen ability energy in some way, and combined with some weapon perks and this, you can really push the limits of chaining abilities together. That being said, you will have to focus a bit more than usual to gain the maximum potential of this exotic. I think you'll get the most value out of this exotic in activities that are around your level so that you're not overkilling everything in sight with your enhanced abilities. That, or you would want to use this in activities where you have fast charging grenade or melee energy. Crest of Alpha Loopy, Loop, Loopy, Loopy, whatever it is, is a defensive insurance exotic that has greater value in more difficult content. The health boost can come in clutch, especially since if you're in trouble, you're probably going to put up a big wall, and then that boost of health can save you from any AoE damage that might be coming in, or those 6th Thrall that might leap through the wall and try to smack you. You will definitely be able to proc this much more often than something like Helm of Saint-14, which only happens with your super. And again, the Armor of Light and Blinding effect of Helm of Saint-14 is a bit overkill. You really only need one or the other, and you get Armor of Light by default anyway. And I haven't even mentioned the extra orb that you create either when you pop your super. It's not a bad pick at all for master level content if you're running Sentinel. If you're running Sunbreaker, then obviously Phoenix is going to be your play. Peregrine Greaves are a lot of fun with Shoulder Charge and when the Brawler modifier is active. That being said, I think I prefer Worm God Caress more because it does not rely on your melee cooldown being active in order for it to work, and you can also use a 1-2 punch shotgun with Worm God. Worm God Caress may be my current favorite Titan exotic in the game because it enables a dominant melee build that works great for Season of Dawn's seasonal activity and by extension, any future activity similar to it. 1-2 punch and a 5 stack of Worm God is incredibly potent on a various amount of subclass blocks. Top tree Sentinel, middle tree Sunbreaker, bottom tree Striker. It's good in the seasonal activity for Season 9 because of the wide range of health pools that you encounter. However, for normal day-to-day -day play, this is just going to be pure overkill, as most red bar enemies will die to a single punch, maybe two, and most mid and high tier enemies can die to a shotgun shot and a follow-up melee. 
For master level content, I'm not too sure how confident I am in suggesting a melee combat style build for safety reasons, as this build relies on chaining kills together rapidly, but if you can keep up the momentum, then you might be able to just kill everything before it kills you, especially with sentinel overshields. Let's move on to PvP now. For PvP, One-Eyed Mask, despite a couple of nerfs, is still the champion. It will take Bungie removing the wall hack portion of this exotic for it to see any sort of competition, but in removing the wall hacks, you really cripple this exotic. There are a ton of other PvP exotics out there. Yes, I know. But are they One-Eyed Mask? Are they wall hacks, free healing, don't have to do anything else in order to benefit good? No, they're not. Even with the nerfs, no more overshield being the latest nerf, nothing comes close to the ease of use and value of One-Eyed Mask for the average player. In terms of subclass specific exotics, Skullfort gives you unlimited shoulder charging and despite all the shotgunning madness in Destiny today, I still see people having success with Skullfort, but you need to play around it 100%. For Sentinels, you're back to Doomfang for PvP. Last year I said Ursa for the energy gains, but that has since been nerfed, so you're unable to spam supers like before. While you still can gain a lot of energy from Ursa, you need to be absolutely pummeled with damage, and even then, I'm not so sure. For Sunbreakers, Halifire Heart for the energy is likely to be the play as generating sunspots in PvP is a little bit of a rarity. Are any of those subclass specific exotics better than what I'd mask? You can maybe make the argument for Skullfort, but otherwise, I think no, which is why I was so, so brief. Titans have not really seen their exotic metagame shift in substantial ways since last year. As for subclass neutral options, we have a lot. ACD Zero Feedback Fence, Syntheseps, Armamentarium, Crest of Alpha Loopy, Heart of Inmost Light, Dune Marchers, Mark 44, Stanicides, and Peregrine Greaves. I will reiterate though, I don't think any of these are better than what I'd mask for the average player, but those who are aware of the potential of some of these exotics can benefit greatly. Armamentarium, again, gonna get you the most value for the least amount of effort based on that list that I just said. It just generates another grenade for you. You don't need to do anything. So if you don't wanna to have to think, and maybe you don't have Skullfort or One-Eyed Mask, then Armamentarium is a good play. If One-Eyed Mask did not exist, I think Crest of Alpha Lupi would have a lot more respect in PvP. Being able to pop your barrier and instantly start regening health is a pretty good deal that can happen many times per game. It can be used to bait people into thinking that you're weak, and it can be used to recover quickly in a fight and re-challenge an enemy. Underrated in my opinion, and I used to run this before One-Eyed Mask was a thing. Feedback Fence used to be about running into a crowd of people with Hammer Strike and then watching them die when one of them retaliated against you with a melee attack. It's still partly about that, but maybe just not as much anymore. I think Feedback Fence's main appeal is now the damage reduction. In a 200 to 200 health punch battle, if you're punched first, the first punch will deal 100 damage to you, but an immediate follow-up will only deal 67, meaning the enemy will need three punches to kill you while you would only need two. There is definitely appeal there for sure if you're an aggressive player or if you're on melee heavy maps. However, you will die in two punches if you don't punch the target back because you need to activate Fury Conductor in between the punches in order to survive. Heart of Inmost Light is a little trickier to pull off in PvP, but you can still make it work like popping a barricade to boost your grenade damage. That's a really specific combo though, and it can be a bit of work to make happen for, in my opinion, not the hugest of gains. Kills are nice, yes, but I think you can get more overall value out of something else. Syntheseps, historically good exotic for those aggressive players. Extending melee lunge range is a great benefit to try to finish off any kills that might be just out of range or getting into range from farther away. Being surrounded, aka three people close to you, in PvP doesn't really happen that often, and I wouldn't rely on that portion of the exotic. It's just too conditional. Also, the only way you can one-punch melee someone while surrounded is if they're already hurt or have 
tier zero resilience, which is just very unlikely. Mark 44 stand sides aren't too bad either, although I tend to think of it as a poor man's skull fort. After all, if you're going to be focusing so hard on shoulder charging, why not use the exotic that gets you a full melee charge back on a kill and health regen, as opposed to just half energy on hit when it already one shots. If you're playing not striker titan, but you still want a shoulder charge, this will get you plenty of shoulder charges. It's not a terrible choice. Antaeus Wards are a pretty high skill exotic to use effectively in PvP. I originally thought these were going to be pretty insane, but I feel like I barely see them if I ever see them at all. I've been sniping a lot recently too, so I'm never really in the fray enough to be reflecting stuff back at people. High payout, but high skill to use. Peregrine Greaves one-shotting supers while in the air along with killing through overshields and whatnot is a very potent effect for PvP. However... The amount of times you'll actually get to use this effect in PvP and actually have it be important, I think, is low. I would probably swap to this after 2-3 to three minutes of a match when supers start appearing. Dune Marchers, another shoulder charge exotic, but it requires you to be on the ground in order to activate. The sprint speed is nice, and Dune Marchers can help you skate a little bit better, not to mention any potential arc lightning chaining effects getting you extra kills. And again, like last time, with Hammer Strike, you have the potential to just chain people to death if they're all bunched up, which is great, but just rare. If I were to order these exotics in terms of what I would use most to least, my list is probably Crest of Alpha Lupi, ACD Zero Feedback Fence, Syntheseps, Mark 44, Heart of Inmost Light, Dune Marchers, Armamentarium, Peregrine, and then Antaeus Wards. That's just a personal list based on how I play PvP nowadays, you should pick yours off of your preferences. We're going to go down the list of the rest of the exotics in the game, not mentioned here, rapid fire mode. Eternal Warrior gives an overshield when using Fist of Havoc. You cannot change your gear in master level content, and I would never use this in a locked PvE activity anyway. This is an exotic that you switch to right before using Fist of Havoc in PvP, and not too much more. In that very specific instance, it's good. In any other instance, it's not. Kepri's Horn fires a blast of solar damage when you plop down a wall. This was buffed so that the line of fire bounces back to the wall, giving you a double wave. Solar damage kills also reduce the cooldown of your wall. This got a significant buff back in Season 6, but I don't think this is anything more than a novelty exotic. You could make a build around this and have it be pretty fun to use, but I think that's really as far as it will go. Mask of the Quiet One regens health on kill when you have no shields and gives you energy when you are damaged, with this effect having a brief cooldown. This is the poor man's one-eyed mask, and while you can proc the health regen endlessly as long as you are weak enough, there aren't that many situations where I think you need to be proccing that continuous health regen. It's more of like an insurance kind of deal. Aeon Safe is unchanged, minus Titans getting melee energy now, but are otherwise ignorable. Ashen Wake is unchanged from last year, instant explosion and faster thrown fusion grenades. This needs a buff, I think, for it to be relevant, and instant explosion does not really do a whole lot for me. Stronghold is the sword exotic. I would combine Stronghold with Black Talon with its catalyst for healing with well-timed blocks and bonus damage via the Black Talon catalyst. That combo is honestly not too shabby, and since you won't waste ammo blocking, it's pretty efficient. A more challenging combo to use, to say the least. Actium War Rig got machine guns thrown onto it in addition to steadily reloading your auto rifle. Mixing this with Sweet Business can result in a lot of shooting without having to reload. Same for something like 21% Delirium, allowing you to keep up killing tally for a very long time. However, those are probably the only two weapons I would bother using if I was wanting to do an Actium War Rig setup. Very fun to do, and since Sweet Business has no reload-based boosts, it just makes sense. I would also maybe use it with Rampage Autos, but I feel like outside of those two main guns, it's not as vital to the experience of using an auto rifle. 
as usual, I don't like to rate movement-based exotics because they are purely personal preference, which is what we have here in Lion Rampant. They don't make you stronger directly with a number increase. They give you a different style of movement, and if you like it, great. And then if you don't, it is useless to you. While the accurate hip fire in air portion is nice, I don't think it's hugely vital to your gameplay experience. Finally, Peacekeepers boost the hell out of your SMGs, auto reloads them, instant ready speed, improved handling and movement while using one. Very solid roster of perks there. Recluse and Huckleberry are super solid SMGs to use with this exotic, but I think devoting an exotic slot solely to boost non-damage based SMG stats and perks is maybe asking a little bit much. The auto reload is nice for sure, but you might be able to live without it. And that is your Titan exotic review list. Warlocks, you guys are up next. As we can see, while some of the low tier exotics did get some minor buffs here and there, it wasn't really enough to bring them into the limelight. Some exotics are just going to be completely helpless without some help, and some are just going to be very specific tools for very specific builds. If you enjoyed this video, a positive rating is appreciated. Please sub to the channel if you are not as well. Hit the little bell thing or whatever it is. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.